Uh, the first thing we have for you today is a tradition at Writers Expo. It is known as a Write Club Bout. And this is where we essentially give two staff members a word. Opposing concepts, you could say. And their job, in five minutes or so, is to defend their side and potentially take down the other side, all with the written word. Okay, today uh, we've got a couple fantastic individuals who have done this before in years past and won. So this is a, this is a battle between two victors. Uh, they're each going to get their five minutes, and then you guys are essentially going to make as much noise as you want for the person you think defended their side better and took down their opponent better. Okay, so get ready when we vote for the winner to make some noise, okay? Uh, so yeah, Dawn versus Dusk is the topic today. We have Mr. Brenner and Mrs. LeMaystre. Mr. Brenner, I hear you're retiring at the end of the year. Uh, what? No? Are you back next year? I hope so. Yeah. No? I was yanking your chain. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, we're going to have Mrs. LeMaystre go first and give uh, Mr. Brenner the honors. So, Mrs. LeMaystre, come on up. Give her a round of applause, folks. Picture. That's an old picture from last year when I did winning versus losing, so I didn't like plan for that one to be up there. No. All right. So I'm talking about dusk. Dawn is great, or at least that's what my high energy type A friends tell me when they're selling me on some early bird excursion to chase a sunrise and begging me to join them while I'm on vacation. They'll sell me on the quietness of the morning, except for the melodious tweeting of birds, of course, in the vibrant colors that are sure to be streaking across a fiery sky, and I'll be nodding and wondering why they need to sell it so hard if it's so amazing. I think Dawn sounds great for the kind of people who really like a plan, who do meal prep and drink the recommended amount of water every day. The kind of people who are weirdly proud about their internal alarm clocks and say things like beast mode or endorphin rush or let's face it, senior discount. I am not one of those people. Dawn is for those enthusiastic, ready to take on the challenges of the day types, the kind of people who will watch a sunrise at 5.42 a.m. and say they want to do yoga or go running and maybe mean it. Me, I'm more of a dusk girl. Dusk is for your cool friends, the stargazers, the ones who recognize the importance of snacks and music as part of any outings, especially ones that require exertion of some sort. The ones who pack s'mores fixings and know how to make a bonfire or know a guy who does. The ones who can play guitar but aren't annoying about it. The ones who know the best place to get a late night burrito. No one has to sell you on it. You don't have to rally for dusk. Dusk is for people who live big and loud and like to get a good night's sleep by not waking up at a reasonable hour. Those of us who understand that the best brunches are the ones that linger into the afternoon, who understand the value of contentment. Brenner will probably tell you that dawn is about new beginnings and the promise of a new day. You know those platitudes you might find on a graduation card or a poster in your therapist's office. It's important to remember that dawn's promises are more of the bleary-eyed sort. They're lies, actually. The kind you tell yourself when it's 5.42 a.m. and what's supposed to be the most exciting event of your lame day is over. It's you, now that you've marveled at the colors streaking across the sky, it's you wondering, now what? And telling yourself that you should probably go running. Sure, dawn is the hope of what your day could be, what it might be. It's a blank slate that needs to be filled. And who needs that kind of pressure? It's life's epic to-do list of plans and dreams that may or may not come to fruition. It's exhausting just thinking about it. Dusk, though, Dusk is a celebration of what your day was, even if your greatest victory of the day, even if your only victory was getting through it. And what a way to celebrate how lovely it is to watch the sherbet colors of the sunset fade into a darkening sky and count the stars one by one by one as they twinkle their way into existence. Quick side note, did you know that sunsets are scientifically more beautiful than sunrises? It has to do with refraction and Raleigh scattering and tropospheric aerosols. It's true. I saw it on Reddit, subreddit, Ask Science. That's true. 
dusk. Scientifically beautiful dusk is the time for making the kind of wishes you don't have to work for. The kind you make on stars, the ones where you don't really mind if they don't come true because today is slipping away and there's always tomorrow, right? But for now, you get to exhale and binge Netflix and hang with your friends. That homework you've been stressing about, that can wait for tomorrow when you're fresh faced and excited about all those possibilities Brenner is sure to mention. Climbing into bed, not out of it, is only hours away. There's a poetry, a grace in endings. Dusk is like the final chapter of a well-loved book. It's the standing ovation you get or give for an exceptional performance. It's the period that punctuates the essay you worked so hard on, making it to the state series after a season of tough practices and tougher competitions. Dusk is a time to reflect, to marvel at the person you're becoming with every passing day, with every passing minute, every success and every scrape. Life can't just be about beginnings, about looking ahead. Dusk isn't the unchecked, untested eagerness of a day that's yet to be. It's the earned reward of a day that was. It's the brilliant result of some parts work and some parts experience. We're only days away from April. We'll blink and it'll be May. Some of you, seniors, Ms. Newberger, Mr. Brenner, some of you are watching the sunset on your days here at LHS. My wish for you is that your sunset is a postcard perfect one. After all, dusk is a beautiful, beautiful ending. Thank you. I told my calculus class how nervous I was. Brooke, are you out there? I'm here. <laughs> Dawn or dusk? I bet there's an opinion by Elon Musk. My feelings are quite firm. The early bird gets the worm. Ah, dawn, the beginning of a new day. So much time to go outside and play. There's even time for a trip to Marseille. You're tired at the end of the day. The beautiful morning skies. I love to see the sun rise. In the morning, nobody cries. The evening is the day's demise. Anticipation comes with first light. A whole day's potential is a delight. We could even find the area of a kite. Path the product of the diagonal sure is right. If you're not done by night, that really does bite. The birds are out there chirping. The farmer is already working. If you wait until nightfall, your duties are shirking. Regrets in the nighttime shadows are lurking. Jones and Brenner are early at school, getting lots done before the day is cool. Busing takes a swim in the pool to wait till evening is cruel. At the crack of dawn, Miss Warfield has kids. Euler's method, they're already in the midst. Calculus early cannot be eclipsed. After school, it's too late. Forget until nightfall and suffer a terrible fate. Did you remember to ask your sweetie on a date? <laughs> on her computer is Miss Elmore. In the morning, she can just do more. After dusk, work is such a bore. You're sleepy, all you can do is snore. At dawn, Shinto goes for a run. To start the day early is so much fun. It's morning as I'm writing this pun. There's no ambition after the setting of the sun. At daybreak, mock trial is proving the case. Each of Duffy's young lawyers is an ace. After dark is not when law takes place. That would be a wild goose chase. The whole day ahead of me, we could solve an inequality. So much promise, you must agree. At bedtime, you only get the nth degree. Every day starts with a clean slate when you see your web assigned due date. Don't procrastinate. You'll kick yourself, why did I wait? <laughs> Let's do some integrals with pi. One over y dy is natural log y. Don't forget the absolute value, it'll sure make you cry. In the morning, I feel so inquisitive. Let's go calculate the derivative. Don't forget the chain rule. You don't want to be thought of as a fool. 
There's time to invent a new serum. Start early, get into the rhythm. For the renowned Pythagorean theorem, the voices of inspiration, I hear them. I might even write a new proof. To start at dusk would be a goof. You can't start your task at night. Your ideas can't take flight. I swear to you that I'm right, but let's not get into a fight. At dusk, my motivation is dead. All I can do is go to bed. And so it is with life. In the beginning, there's a lot less strife. What's better, the beginning or the end? Early, my position I defend. How great when the movie is just starting. So much better than now ending. I await the game's first pitch. Get hit by the ball and you'll need a stitch. Late in the game, your throw is in the ditch. Time to make that pitching switch. A brand new car is your pride. It'll keep you in stride. Better by far than that worn out old ride. This truth cannot be denied. Consider the young new teacher, full of spunk and new ideas to feature. Better than some old dude about to retire. This project sure made him perspire. So my case I rest, a morning person I am blessed. Convinced you, I hope I did. You're a really smart kid. That dawn exceeds dusk was my intent. At the end of this day, I am spent. All right, the early bird gets the worm, but who will get this gigantic Writer's Expo sticker? That is what you guys are going to figure out right now. I am pulling up my decibel reader. If you believe that Mrs. LeMaistry had the better piece of writing, make some noise. That's respectable, over 90. If you believe the winner should be Mr. Brenner, make some noise. Mr. Brenner, congratulations. We can send you off with the dog. All right, fantastic. Um, I forgot my clicker on the floor. This is why we need AV people. Could you guys advance to the next slide for me? Uh, there we go. Okay, so this is another uh, awesome uh, tradition here at Writers Expo. Now you get to hear three stories from three fantastic individuals. Uh, whom hopefully you recognize. Each one is going to tell a story that's about five minutes long. Two of them are telling a truth. One is lying to you, okay? They're going to tell their stories one by one, and then you are going to ask some questions trying to figure out which one of them is actually lying. So as they are telling the stories, be thinking, how can I figure out if they're telling the truth or if they're lying? Okay. Uh, let us welcome them on stage. We have Ms. Newberger, Mr. Schmidt, and Mr. or Dr. Quintus. Sorry, come on up, folks. You guys can reside in the three comfy chairs over there. Very good. Uh, do you guys have a preference? Would you like to use the podium? Would you like to use the center mic? Yeah? Okay, well, we'll just keep the podium rolling then. Uh, who would you all like to hear from first? Audience choice. Oh, okay. Dr. K, you're up first. All right, this story is true. That's a lie. Well, that's true. Well, maybe that's a lie. You'll have to figure it out. It was love at first sight. There we were, Mick, Tony, and I, three best friends at our eighth grade graduation dance. This was a big night because there were three junior highs in my town, and it was tradition that at the eighth grade dance, we all came together to meet one another before we became one freshman class in high school. I remember walking in the gym and Tony just stopping dead in his tracks. He had locked eyes with Lori Angston. 
one of the most popular girls at Iroquois Junior High, and that was the school on the wrong side of the tracks. Well, the train tracks separating our schools might stop us kids at Algonquin from mingling with those tough Iroquois kids, but that didn't stop Cupid's arrow from piercing Tony's heart from that moment Tony was head over heels in love with Lori. Now here's the unfortunate thing for every eighth grade soon to be freshman boy. No matter how cool and popular you are in junior high, when you go to high school, you absolutely have no game whatsoever. And you have no chance of winning the attention of a freshman girl as popular as Lori because you have to try to compete against the sophomores and sometimes even the juniors. So knowing this, Tony did what every self-respecting 14-year-old guy does. He moved into Lori's friend zone. That's right. Throughout the next few years of high school, Tony, Mick, and I were virtually inseparable from Lori and her friends, Shelby, Christina, and Erica. We went out every weekend together. We were so close, we called ourselves the group. Now, Lori always had a boyfriend, and Tony usually had a girlfriend. But it might have been a coincidence, but by junior year, we started realizing that whenever Lori would break up with her boyfriends, Tony's relationships with his girlfriends would suddenly come to an end as well. Strange. Well, fast forward to senior year winter break. At this point, we were all accepted to colleges. We only had a semester left before going our separate ways. Tony still loves Lori, but he's basically accepted that when it comes to romance, she's out of his league. And I'll never forget what happened that fateful Saturday night. The group had just got back from Blockbuster. We were gonna watch a video at my house and it had just snowed and before we went inside, we started having a snowball fight. I ran up behind Tony and smashed a snowball over his head and he was mad because he was trying to keep his hair properly spiked for Lori and I messed it up. As I ran away, he began packing an ice ball and he packed it tight. I should mention, Tony was a varsity baseball player. He had an arm that was a cannon and the ice ball in his hand had bad intentions for me. So I come running around the corner of the house and Tony locks in on me. He cocks back his arm and he launches a fastball right at my head. I'm lucky though, I'm an elite athlete. And I see this meteor streaming towards me and I duck. Unfortunately, running right behind me, yep, it was Lori. And you guessed it, the next sound we all heard was that ice ball smacking Lori straight in the face and her falling like a sack of potatoes to the ground, crying in pain. This was one of those slow motion movie moments, you know, where Tony yells, no, and something really bad happens. Well, we all immediately rushed to help Lori. Her nose was bleeding, her lip was fat. She had a black and swollen eye. We moved her into the kitchen. We got out a bag of frozen peas. We put it on her face and we couldn't find Tony. He had disappeared. And no matter how much we looked, we couldn't find him. Till we did, locked in my bedroom. We begged him to come out and he wouldn't. We knocked on the door, we told him it was fine. He refused to leave. After about an hour, Lori, still looking like she'd been in a Mike Tyson fight, was feeling better and she would go try to tell Tony that things were okay. About 45 minutes later, Shelby said, I gotta go, where's Lori? 30 seconds after that, Shelby came back in the room looking like she'd just seen a ghost. She was wide-eyed and in shock. When we asked what's up, Shelby stuttered, Lori, Tony, making out. <laughs> what? We squealed, you mean making up? Yeah, making up and making out. Well, you can imagine the group went nuts. Short time later, Lori and Tony came back to the family room looking a bit sheepish and holding hands. They then announced they were going to prom together. Fast forward now, 32 years later, Tony and Lori are married and have three kids. The group remains close friends, but we never let Tony and Lori have a snowball fight for fear it will knock sense back into Lori and she'll dump Tony right on the spot. Thank you.
Okay, not planned, but this is also a story about love or first crushes or whatever. All right, so first crush, first day of second grade, because I got, I got into that a little earlier than you guys did, I guess. But anyway, uh, so for the first time in my life, I was slack-jawed, speechless. It was like this angelic revelation of a girl paralyzed my soul. My stomach swirled even as my muscles, mind, and mouth froze. I was like a marble statue, drooling and gawking at her like a creep. Until that moment, I could always depend on being able to blurt out something. In fact, my mouth had uh, gotten me into quite a bit of trouble over the years, uh, since I had what my parents, teachers, and counselors, and principal had said was a lack of a filter. But all I could do was stare at her brown hair, braided up in a bun, and her slim arms. I remember thinking her arms were amazing. Uh, something about her reminded me of Princess Leia in the end ceremony of episode four when her hairstyle's kind of done up and she's whatever. Um, you know when Chewie doesn't get the medal? Everybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, all right. And then someone said something funny and I knew this had to be true love because it wasn't just her looks. No, it was her laugh that washed over me like a wave of warm cinnamon. Her name was Debbie McFarland. Sadly, that was about all I learned that day because I was still too nervous to walk up and say hi like a normal person. Because normal wasn't me. Normal wasn't what I felt. Normal wasn't what we were destined to become. So I racked my brain for a way to make the right first impression. And an agonizing month crawled by. But in October, I overheard Debbie and her friends, who I also studied meticulously in case that would help me get closer to Debbie, and yes, I know how that sounds, uh, but that's what I did. Uh, talking about, uh, they were talking about scary movies and aliens. And I was like, what? Hold up. Did this girl like science fiction? Back then, I couldn't really have told you what sci-fi as a genre was, but I knew I loved Star Wars, uh, so this was huge. This was going to be my in. So this, I could totally do. So Halloween was approaching, and I started working on a scary costume for school, because they've been talking about monsters and sci-fi and all that. I didn't want anything as boring and cliche as a vampire or a werewolf. I wanted something that said something about me as a person. So I started making a Tuscan Raider mask in my art class. Note, uh, Tuscan Raiders are the nomadic thugs who live on Tatooine and gave Luke Skywalker a hard time when he went searching for R2-D2. Uh, then Luke gets in a fight with a Tuscan Raider and Obi-Wan shows up and all that. Okay, so they wore tattered sand-colored clothes, like robes. Um, and their masks were kind of like a closed beehive thing with goggles and they had like metal spikes sticking out. I don't know. Anyway, I'm sure you all know Tuscan Rick's for sure. Okay. Uh, my art teacher let me do a paper mache project to make the mask uh, out of a helmet. Uh, but I had to be careful that Debbie didn't see it until it was done, uh, but it did turn out pretty awesome. Uh, I made the beehive head thing by taping a plastic mask to the toy army helmet and then I glued that stuff together, and then I glued goggles on top of that, and then I used white chalk as, like, broken white chalk as, like, the metal spiky things. Uh, I covered all of that with wet, gross uh, plaster, except for the eyes, so I could see out, obviously. Uh, and the next day, I painted it a light tan, except for the mouth, which was a darker brown. And it looked pretty wicked and awesome. I was very proud of it. Uh, the rest of the costume was easy, because it was just light brown robes and whatever. Uh, but the mask, putting on the mask, that changed me. I felt powerful. I felt amazing, bold, creative, and a bit itchy, but that was okay. Uh, on Halloween, I felt confident and cool, elated and eager, unknown and unafraid. So I went right up to Debbie McFarlane and waited because she was talking to my buddy Garth and had her back to me, and I didn't want to be rude. When there was a lull in her conversation, I said, hey, Debbie, and was ready to let fly with my best joke, but when she turned around and saw me, she screamed with such terror that I almost crapped my pants. It was the kind of terror you could only see or hear in a movie, but that you'd never get from Princess Leia. Debbie was shrieking, backing up quickly, but not looking away from me, nearly tripping over Garth, catching her breath and screaming again, then spinning and lunging away, whipping herself around and behind the teacher's desk until she was huddled down and taking shelter from me. Everything else stopped. It was very strange and surreal, but it was also somehow very clearly my fault. 
Everyone turned from Debbie, who was now whimpering behind the desk, to the evil kid who had made the pretty girl cry. Mrs. Hill, our teacher, ran over, glared at me with anger and confusion, but went to Debbie. Uh, then she knelt down and put her arms around Debbie, comforting her and asking her what was wrong, telling her it would be okay, and all that kind of stuff. And me, I did some pretty quick calculations. It occurred to me now, or then, uh, I had misinterpreted what I had partially overheard weeks before. Debbie's friends were laughing about a scary monsters and aliens and such, but Debbie was not laughing. She hated that stuff because she had seen some movie that gave her nightmares. And my mask, it was just way too good. So, after things calmed down and I had some sense of my huge mistake, I went to the bathroom and took off the costume and regarded the mask regretfully. But I still kept it because it was awesome. I was left looking like a poster child for everything khaki because I was just in tan robes. I went from the kid with the coolest costume to the kid with the absolute lamest. Mrs. Hill asked me to sit in the back of the class, not because I was in trouble, but just as a favor so as not to upset the love of my life. Because the girl of my dreams was afraid to look in my general vicinity. Needless to say, this absolutely destroyed my confidence, and I didn't try talking to girls again for years and years. But I did learn a valuable lesson that I'm happy to pass on to you. Stalking does not work. Uh, and looking back on it now, I can find one more upside. I found out before things even got started and before our little hearts could truly be broken, that Debbie and I would never have worked. We were not destined for each other because Debbie hated Star Wars. Good morning. Good morning. I, I just wanted to say that before I retire at the end of this year, I wanted to do this one time. This is my first time I've ever done this, so please be patient with me. There was a girl at my high school who was in a Vidal Sassoon magazine ad, you know, the shampoo and the hair products. She was not someone everyone in our 600 person class knew. She was quiet, reserved, not in any sports or activities, but to me, she was mysterious and glamorous. I thought she was the coolest person in the world and I wanted to be just like her. So I went home one afternoon from school and I told my mom I wanted to be a model. Thank you for not laughing, that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> she was great and supportive about it, just like I hoped she would be. She signed me up for a class, booked composite photos, and helped me start my soon-to-be-amazing modeling career. We hopped on the train at a moment's notice to go downtown into the city on what were known as cattle calls. I was on my way. Unfortunately, I never got one call back or a modeling job. Not even once. Fast forward to life after college, I was teaching at Evanston High School and living in Wrigleyville. People had always told me I had the most beautiful hands and fingernails. There was a well-known hand model and foot model in Chicago named Judy Lujak, and I thought, well, maybe this was my destiny. I went to the agency that represented Judy, and I met with the people there. They were very excited and made me feel very special. Judy was getting older and here were young, flawless hands. They said I might be their new top hand and foot model. Literally within days I was getting calls out to the suburbs to take a photo of a small medical device for a company brochure, downtown to be in a famous footwear commercial, and then off to a Wagner Power Painter commercial. I had no idea there were so many opportunities for someone with nice hands and feet. My portfolio was growing and I was finally living my dream. Then one late summer morning, I got a call. I needed to be downtown in 30 minutes for a print ad. I could have made it to the job. I could have given up my plans for a Cubs game in the bleachers on that glorious summer afternoon, but I told them I couldn't make it and they never called me again. And that is the story of my illustrious albeit short, modeling career. All right. 
there you go. Time to figure out who the liar is. I'm going to hand this microphone off to Dr. K so that they can pass it back and forth between them. Be good. There we go. Okay. Uh, I can walk to you. You can always shout out your question because we can hear pretty good in here. Um, anybody have a question to try and figure out who the liar is, who the truth teller is? In the back, shout it out. Um, Who's it for? Uh, principal. Okay. Um, what color was Lori's hair? Lori had brownish hair, and when Tony saw her at the eighth grade dance, there was a thing called a waffle press, and she had the waffle press and feathered bangs, and she had a feather in her hair that was attached to part of her hair. It was cool during the 80s. That is hyper-specific. Uh, yes, sir, right there in the middle. Uh, so you mentioned there were three junior highs for Dr. K. Uh, there was Algonquin, there was Iroquois. What was the third one? Chippewa. We were very culturally sensitive in displays. There were a lot of students on their phones when you guys were telling the story. I'm, one, I'm just assuming they were fact checking you as, as much as possible, but uh, yes. Um, Mr. Schmidt, um, what year did the fourth Star Wars movie come out? Which one? The Star Wars movie that you referred. Oh, I was referring to episode four, but it wasn't called episode four at the time. It was just called Star Wars, and then it said A New Hope, and the stuff came out. But it came out on May 25th, 1977. Sure. What year were you in second grade? 1980. Empire Strikes Back had come out the previous May. I don't remember the exact date, but it was a big day for me. Yeah. Return of the Jedi did not exist. Uh, any further questions? Yeah. <laughs> All right, he's got some. Hand in the air. Oh, I was just out of, I graduated college in 1988 and I moved to Wrigleyville in 1989, so it was that time 1989 to 1991. Or did I, I started working here in 1995, is that the question? It's a good detail. Uh, William, go for it. Fort, Garth Fort. Yeah, I think he's doing quite well actually, but I, I, I don't, I'm not sure. You know, I moved around a lot, but I, I, I heard he was doing well. Whatever. Questions? Keep them coming. We still got a couple minutes. The best player on the Cubs at 1988. Let's see, I kind of go from the 70s to now. All right. Um, Sandberg? Sean Dunstan, is that? That was earlier, wasn't it? That was later? No, Sean's I'm thinking playing. Ron Say, but I think he was earlier too. He was earlier. Bill Buckner was in the 70s, so that's not right. Yeah, I don't know. I was just on the outfield at the bleachers. Go for it, Louie. Do you like the Marvel movies? Uh, yes, I could answer any question you could possibly have about the Marvel movies. Do you like Star Wars or the Marvel is better? Uh, nowadays, I would definitely say Marvel. Star Wars has had too many fumbles, in my opinion. All right, time is up. You need to make a decision. If you think Dr. K is the one who is lying, please raise your hand. That's a good third of the eye. Oh, that, that's getting close to half. Uh, if you think Ms. Newberger is lying, please raise your hand. Ouch. Okay. Schmidt, how many of you think he's lying? That is, that's a pretty divided audience. I think that uh, tells you you guys did a wonderful job. Uh, liar, please stand. Well done, Mr. Schmidt. Now, we need to give this man a round of applause because originally the trio had 
Dr. Jeff Brown, who couldn't make it this morning. Mr. Schmidt had to fill in the last minute and fooled a good number of you. So a round of applause extra for Mr. Schmidt. Stepping in last minute.